Thank you everyone for joining us, ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Küchler and Lord Pickles. My name is Bea Lefkowitz and I'm the director of the AGR Refugee Voices Archive. It's my honor to address you today for the first ever AGR Refugee Voices Holocaust Memorial event. This event is being recorded, so please switch off your video if you don't want to appear. This is a Zoom live event and I hope the technology is not going to fail us. Um, first, you will hear a few words from me, uh, then from the AGR Chief Executive Michael Newman, followed by the address of Ambassador Michaela Küchler and the Right Honourable Lord Pickles. We will then watch an 11 minutes version of the film Voices for a Better World, and we're very privileged today to have four interviewees with us, Eva Clark, Kurt Marx and Anne and Bob Kirk, who will share some reflections. The closing remarks will be given by second generation Susie Kaufman, whose mother, Eva Shapira, features in the film and who ran the AJR Day Center for many years. As many of you will know, we started collecting video interviews for the AJR Refugee Voices Archive in 2003, 18 years ago. Since then, we've interviewed almost 260 refugees and survivors, which means we hold about 1,000 hours of video testimony and more than 5,500 photographs and documents in our collection which we share through our website, social media channels, and partner institutions. In the last six months, uh, more than 35,000 pages on our website were visited. So on our 18th birthday, which coincides with the 80th anniversary year of the AJR, we would like to confirm our commitment to safeguard, protect, and share the personal and collective stories of our interviewees. The digital realm provides us with endless opportunities, but we also need to make sure that we protect the testimonies from misuse, such as decontextualization, sensationalism, and invasion of privacy. As we are at a stage where, to borrow a term from memory scholar Jan Asman, communicative memory is becoming cultural memory, that is to say history, we need to ask ourselves, how do we envisage the future of Holocaust testimonies given the fact that testimonies of survivors and refugees have played a central role in Holocaust education worldwide. Watching last week's International Holocaust Memorial Day commemoration, one could see the new ways of engaging with testimonies. There were conversations between first and second or first and third generations. There were second and third generation members telling the story of their parents and grandparents, some also with uh, content of the Refugee Voices Archive. And as in the case of the Hackney Holocaust Memorial Day event, school children were reading excerpts from two AJR Refugee Voices interviews with Bertha Klipstein and Lily Pullman to highlight the role of Rabbi, so Rabbi Dr. Solomon Schoenfeld in their rescue. As educators, we need to ask ourselves which usage of testimonies will have the greatest impact to further Holocaust education and combat antisemitism and racism. Do we need to create more three-dimensional interviews so that future pupils can relate to survivors? Should we train more second and third generations to go into schools? Or do we need to prepare bite-sized pieces of interviews which fit the two minutes allocation of social media accounts or a 50 minutes lesson plan? What can we learn from the survivors and refugees who have gone and shared their testimonies tirelessly for the last decades in schools? These questions form the background for my film, Voices for a Better World, the legacy of testimonies. I wanted to go back to the interviews and present the messages and reflections offered by the interviewees to make us think what responsibility we have as the caretakers of the interviewees, stories, documents, and photographs. The film features excerpts from 80 interviews, and this is to celebrate the 80th anniversary of the AJR, who came to the UK as survivors from Nazi Europe post-war or as refugees pre-war many of them on the kinder transport. The oldest interviewee in the film was born in 1909, Frederick Fischer in Poland, and the youngest was born in Mauthausen concentration camp in April, 1945, with Eva Clark, and you will meet her shortly. She's with us today. You can, we can see snapshots of 80 interviewees. We hear their voices and words, we see their image, and witness not only the narration, but also the silences and the pain. While their stories are often traumatic and complex, their messages are very clear. 
the interviewees underline the importance of tolerance, of understanding, of democracy, and of peace. At the end of the first ever interview recorded for Refugee Voices, conducted in 2003, with a woman called Elena Lederman, who some of you might know, she had a chocolate uh, business called Elena Chocolates, who survived the war in hiding with her son in Brussels. She said, quote, well, I would like the war never to come again. I don't want any new generation to know what we knew. This is a wish for everyone and to be a lesson for the new generation, not to have wars. Elena Lederman captured the basic sentiment expressed in different variations in most AGR Refugee Voices interviews. I hope that by listening to the reflections and messages of the interviewees, we will find inspiration on how to survive hardship and tragedy, and that these messages will also inspire us to create visionary future digital resources for Holocaust education. So that we can, to quote interviewee John Itzpicki, think of the past and not let it become the future. For me, all the interviewees who've shared the memories of their lives and their losses are true examples of lights in the darkness, the theme of this year's Holocaust Memorial Day. We are committed to let their lights continue to shine. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the Secretariat of the, Germany, of the German Presidency of um, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and especially Ambassador Küchler for generously supporting the making of this film. And I'd like to thank the trustees of the Association of Jewish Refugees for believing in the power of oral history testimonies from the early beginning in 2003. And I'd like to thank the Refugee Voices team for all their hard work in the last years. Thank you, and I'm passing you over now to Michael Newman, the Chief Executive of the AJR. Thank you very much, Bea. Uh, and my first task is an easy one, is to congratulate you, not only on the production of the film, but uh, in the ongoing collection uh, of this valuable material. Uh, we know from speaking with colleagues at other organizations how valuable this, this testimony is. So uh, kola kavod and credit to you all for everything that you have done and that you are doing. Uh, and thank you, uh, Bea, for, uh, for the quick introduction and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I see that we've built this event as an HMD uh, gathering. Um, and although HMD was last week, I think this gives everyone really a sense of uh, how uh, HMD has proliferated uh, and how many more commemorative gatherings there are, and also how memorialization has spread both in the calendar but also in society. And perhaps some of that's uh, due to the pandemic and the immediate availability of online material, but maybe it's also that remembrance of the Holocaust itself is increasing. Uh, and of course, there are many more events both this week uh, and into next week. Uh, I want to talk briefly about uh, not only the importance of, and role of testimonies that we've captured, but I have two uh, related requests. For some of you, uh, this may be your first encounter with the AJR and the work that we do to represent and support Holocaust refugees and survivors and providing social welfare. Uh, it's become even more critical at this time. So the first request is if you or anyone you know needs any assistance, please do let us know so that we can, uh, we can make an intervention. And I say that also because we miss particularly the in-person interaction with our members. Usually, like the event we had last week, we would have greeted members uh, at our commemoration and indeed so many other gatherings these past months. So whenever we can, we're looking to maintain contact. Uh, and alongside our social welfare support, the second limb of our work is to engage with the second and third generations because they themselves have a unique perspective to share that, uh, continuing the analogy of be the light in the darkness, it itself sheds light not only on the human stories of the Holocaust, course, but its legacy uh, to today. And so we can be said that those who take up the mantle of family heritage and remembrance are themselves exemplifying the theme of being the light in the darkness. Not only are the second and third generation becoming the standard bearers, they are preserving the link through the AJR uh, to their parents and grandparents' lives. So the second request is if you are of the refugee background or you know someone that is, please do consider joining our community uh, and playing a role in preserving that unique uh, heritage uh, for future generations. 
And so today is a focus on the third part of our work, supporting the development of Holocaust educational and commemorative resources and celebrating our unique Refugee Voices archive. It captures and preserves for study and in, perpe in perpetuity the lives, experiences, culture and heritage of the refugees who came to Britain. And so keeping in mind the theme of Be the Light in the Darkness, I, I would also argue that the Refugee Voices archive itself is that light, literally bringing illumination as well as a deeper understanding of Jewish uh, life in pre-war Europe, of the mutation of anti-Semitism, and of course of escape and survival. And while there can be a tendency to also frame the archive uh, as the stories of how people rebuilt their lives in Britain and the contribution to their adopted country, we recognise that not all were able to. And so we'll, while we rightly um, celebrate those who made a disproportionate contribution Hard as it is to believe, not every Jewish refugee became a Nobel Prize winner. As we move from living to documented history, our mission is also strengthened by harnessing the warnings from the past with the emerging technology, so that this and subsequent generations can engage and interact, and so that they can challenge Holocaust denial and distortion. Which brings me neatly on to our first two speakers uh, alluded to just earlier, who I would even go so far as to say are special friends of the AJR, to share some thoughts on today's event and also the role testimonies can play. So in a moment we will hear from uh, Lord Pickles, the UK Special Envoy for Post-Holocaust Issues, uh, who among his many other roles is the head of the UK IRA delegation, of which I'm proud to be a member, but first, I'd like to give the floor over to Ambassador Michaela Kukla, who's the president of the IRA. Uh, and of course, uh, she's chairing the, uh, um, the IRA for this year until March uh, in Germany's year of the chairmanship of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Michaela, uh, if I can pass you the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Bea and uh, Michael, for your un introductory words. Uh, thank you very much, Lord Pickles, for being here as head of the British delegation to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the, the IRA. And I'd also like to thank all those who organized this meeting this afternoon and those who worked uh, on the film that you, Bea, produced so diligently for the IRA plenary in November and December last year, uh, 2020. Namely, you, you yourself, Ed Scrain, Julian Dawes, the AGC as an organization, and above all, the survivors, the kinder transportees who told their stories. Thank you very much for participating in this great endeavor. Um, the film is a pretty good example for the theme of this meeting, or for the theme of what I was asked to speak about, to speak about and that is digital remembrance. Originally, we planned for the IRA winter plenary to come together in Leipzig in, in the southeast of Germany and uh, to come together in a hotel in Leipzig and to have this exhibition displayed in the hotel lobby as an exhibition. COVID-19 was stronger than we were <laughs> and uh, with, a, with a lockdown or the half lockdown we had, uh, we could not realize that and we asked Bea uh, if she couldn't switch to a digital um, exhibition and she said yes she could but she would rather do a film and that is how this film came into the making and it was successfully displayed and shown to those who attended the, um, the, the IRA plenary around 200 uh, persons all of them specialists in the field of holocaust research, education, memorials, museums and so on. And now it's going to be shown in a short version to you, a restricted public, but I'm, but it is also available on, on, on YouTube so that a broad public can, can use this, uh, this very important resource uh, for watching, but also for, um, for further research. Um, But already in the beginning, when we were still 
planning an exhibition, we thought about integrating digital elements into this real life exhibition. For instance, we, we were discussing about using QR codes to, on, on each of the pictures, on each of the portraits of the, of the kinder transportees that were going to be displayed on huge photographs. Um, and with the QR codes, having access to further information also in more different languages, not only in English or German, but in more languages. So digital memory, digital remembrance is really something that has been going on for a couple of years. And it's, and it has, um, and it has got, and it will, I'm sure it will uh, be, get in the future even more, an impulse from this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which, well, restrains us to our homes, <laughs> where you can see sit, sitting me in front of my bookshelf. And um, so it, it, it has given an, an, an impulse, if not a disruption, to, to the way we are working together in the field of Holocaust remembrance, as in so many other fields. Why is it so important to remember digitally? Well, first of all, because the IRA has pledged already in its underlying founding document, if I may say, say so, in the year 2000 in the Stockholm Declaration, and it has reinforced that statement, that pledge, in its 2020 ministerial declaration, I'm citing from that, has pledged to the victims and survivors that they shall never be forgotten and that their legacy will be kept alive. And I may add, forever. Um, but we are now here in a situation where we have fewer and fewer survivors or witnesses among us. And if it is true that nothing can replace the in-person interaction the telling of a story of a survivor, of an eyewitness, videos or interviews with survivors which allow the spectator, the one who is watching, to ask around 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 questions to the person on, on the screen and an algorithm is choosing the correct answer. This is, I would say, more than just second best choice. Um, and it is not so new because we have had already in the past uh, not only interperson, in-person reactions, survivors sitting in front of a school class telling their stories, children asking them questions, but we've had also in, already in the past um, testimonies that were, for instance, in reports, in, uh, in books, in videos, uh, in films, in TV series. I just would like to remind you of the uh, famous 1979 TV series, um, The Holocaust, with, uh, with Meryl Streep. So this is not so new to us to remember uh, not sitting in front of a person who has gone through all of that, but also watching, using different media, I would say. But there are, I, I think there are some, some thoughts we should give about digital, uh, digital remembrance. One is that videos and so-called holograms, so 3D videos with the possibility to ask questions, they should involve real people not avatars, not creations of a computer, but real people. Secondly, in memorial sites, which are abundant on the continent, we should have, uh, like in, 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 in the real world, the reality in front of us. So if we have a memorial site like Auschwitz or Sachsenhausen in the real world, we should not try to add something like, like buildings or so to it. We can repair, we can restore, but we should keep as much as possible the original structure and not trying to find a, a, a supplement structure. And that's valid also for the digital remembrance. We have things like augmented reality or virtual reality. 
Augmented reality, in my view, is acceptable for digital remembrance because it supports, it helps imaginations if there are some remnant, only some very few remnants left in a memorial site and augmented reality could help to, to, to support the imagination and thus to feel much better how it must have been 70, 80 years ago. But we should refrain from using virtual reality where there is nothing left. That is also a message because the Nazis in 1945 or 1944, they started destroying the, uh, the sites, the witnesses, the stolen witnesses of, of their crimes. And that is also a message. So not using virtual reality, I think is, is, is something very important. Um, at the last IRA plenary meeting in December, we heard an expert for digital remembrance through gaming. That is something we, I think we should, dis uh, we should consider like computer gaming. It's, it's something which um, opens the space for uh, people who usually would not watch videos on of Holocaust survivors or uh, films like uh, the Oskar Schindler film, but they, they move in the gaming world and you can reach them through these games, but one must be very, very cautious when programming these games that we don't come in a situ situation where people start, um, start taking on the role of, 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 of a killing person and that uh, could cause some very um, not wanted uh, consequences. Um, so this is a very new field of digital remembering, but it is something that is being explored. And I think also that we must explore it. Um, there are, as I just explained, uh, tried to explain, there are dangers to digital remembrance, but there are also some advantages. Of course, first of all, we can reach much more people than we can with, a, with an in-person event. Last week, and also this event here, show, has shown and shows us that uh, digital remembrance can involve much more people from many more different places of, uh, in the world than uh, real remembrance can. Um, that is one, one, one advantage. Um, it, uh, it is also possible to, to, to try and have, uh, have new media uh, coming to a, to a digital remembrance act. So um, I think all in all, first of all, we cannot avoid that we go in that direction. Secondly, I think we should use the, the, the chances that are open for us now in the field of digital remembrance, uh, but we should use them cautiously, taking our precautionary measures. And the most important thing is in the real world as in the digital world, we must rely on the facts. And that brings me to um, to a campaign that was launched also, also last week by the IRA, by the European Union, by the United Nations, which is called Protect the Facts. And it is an important campaign because, um, well, you all know that in, in this time of pandemic, there are so many um, um, myths flowing around um, that we really must come back to the facts, rely on the facts and protect the facts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michaela. And uh, if I could now introduce and hand the, the metaphorical mic over to Lord Pickles. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Michael. It's a real pleasure to be following Michaela, who has been an absolutely outstanding chairman of IRA and indeed the German presidency has uh, shown enormous leadership in a time when 
everything has been uh, virtual, it's not been possible to meet at once uh, um, in Germany. And uh, the latter point um, about uh, looking at Tolokov's uh, distortion is going to be of enormous significance uh, in the coming decade. Now, when I was at school, which is a wee while ago, so the 60s and early 70s, there's virtually no discussion about the Holocaust, no discussion about the uh, kinder transport. Uh, it's been only as we've gradually begun to understand uh, that the generations are moving and that soon the memory of the Holocaust will go from common memory into um, the history books, that we've taken such a, a lot of effort into ensuring that we've got uh, testimony of survivors. And to be a Georgia, uh, the testament that you put together is an immensely important part of getting the, these, uh, these testimonies uh, down. And it's not just that we will, when the time comes that we go into the history books that we'll be missing good friends and uh, and uh, good companionship it's also uh, an understanding that that will be a critical time so far as holocaust uh, remembrance uh, is concerned and it's not a question of you know whether we produce things in writing or produce things in films or produce th things digital in a way the media is not the message to misquote uh, Marshall McLuhan. It's about ensuring that that gradual, insidious way in which Holocaust distortion has crept into a kind of a moral um, equivalence uh, that has become, I think, de uh, deeply worrying, seeking to dilute uh, the facts, seeking to um, misrepresent what, what, uh, what has happened. So we know that from quite a number of historical events, once the last survivor um, has gone, that's the, that's the point where people start to uh, relook at and reevaluate. And these testimonies are so massively important because they show what human beings are capable of doing to fellow human beings. And uh, these testimonies keep that alive and keep the authenticity of what happened um, alive. We need to ensure as we move forward that there can never be any doubt as to what happened. You know, uh, Michaela is, uh, is, is, is quite right about ensuring that we have to adhere to the facts. The people who are concerned with Holocaust distortion and denial, truth is, these people can tell as many lies as they like. It doesn't matter because what, they, what their entire philosophy is based on is a lie. But we can't afford to make a mistake. We can't afford to get a fact wrong. We can't afford to manufacture anything and Michaela is quite right we we cannot produce something that that isn't there that's where the holocaust uh, memorial next to parliament is going to play such an important part we're waiting for the final decision with regard to the uh, with regard to town and country planning but the Secretary of State made an important announcement last Thursday that the, uh, the uh, admission into the new learning centre will be free and that it will be free not just for a few years, but in perpetuity. That is an enormous commitment that the government has made. Now, I hope that we'll see the planning uh, permission uh, sometime maybe in April and that we'll be able to start construction this year. Because the learning center is going to be important. It will be a place where testimony is stored. It will be a place in which we will examine uh, the uh, role of uh, 
uh, the British uh, government and the British communities during uh, the, the Holocaust. And we will be uh, telling things that we're very proud of, uh, but we'll also be showing things that we're deeply ashamed of, where we could have done something, where we actually uh, turned our back on the possibility of, uh, of helping uh, Jewish people. But we'll be using the resources, not just of this country, but we'll be linking up throughout um, uh, England, uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and our international uh, partners to ensure that we will be part of a broader coalition to ensure that the truth and the honesty of the Holocaust is heard, that our light will, will shine into the darkest corners and ensure that this country does not forget what happened. We will ensure that this country will examine subsequent uh, genocides. We will ensure that when others in Europe are seeking to rewrite their, their history, that our Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre will be one that will, that will show the unvarnished truth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Kuchler and Lord Pickles for sharing your profound thoughts with us today. Before we screen the short version of the film, um, there are two more people who I'd like to thank. Um, the actor and director, Ed Scrine, whose grandmother had come to the UK on the kinder transport and who narrates the beginning of the film, and I think who is also with us today. And the composer, Julian Dawes, uh, who allowed me to use his beautiful piece of music composed for solo cello. Uh, Thank you, Julian. Julian is with us today as well. So let me now share my screen with you. And... Oh, yeah, just while you're doing that, may yeah. I also add uh, another thank you uh, to someone else who's on the event today, to Tony sure. Grenville, who of course, of course. did some of, some of the original interviews uh, for the collection as well. Nice to see you, Tony. Yes, of course, Tony. Of course, Tony was my my co-founding director, and uh, of course, sorry, I, yeah. Um, thank you so much. And now we're going to screen the film. And I hope this. You got sound? Jewish refugees from Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia fled to Britain before the outbreak of World War II to escape systematic persecution by the Nazi regime. By 1939, about 60,000 refugees managed to emigrate to the UK on domestic service visas, transit visas, as unaccompanied children on the kinder transport or through other forms of sponsorship. They were joined after 1945 by a small number of Jewish children and young adults who had survived the war in Nazi Europe, often without their family, in concentration camps, in hiding, or with false identities. Another wave of refugees, many of them Holocaust survivors, came to Britain from Hungary in 1956. Since 2002, the AJR Refugee Voices Archive has captured the testimony of more than 250 of these refugees and survivors. In these oral history interviews, the interviewees recall the stories of their families and their childhood homes in places like Berlin, Vienna, Prague, Krakow, Cologne, Frankfurt, Bamberg, Bratislava, Bonn, Budapest, Munich, Hamburg, and many more. They recall their life journeys and the many challenges they faced. They reflect on their often traumatic experiences of separation and displacement 
and on their lives and achievements after the war. Some of the interviewees have been active Holocaust educators for many years. Some have never told their stories. Many interviewees who have given their testimony to the AJR Refugee Voices Archive are not alive anymore. This film captures the reflections, messages and hopes of the refugees and survivors in the United Kingdom who wanted their words and voices to be heard and who wanted future generations to reflect on the legacy of their testimonies. My message would be, think of the past and don't let it become the future. I'm not one to advise people, it's a lot of what wiser people about, but I think don't look back, just look forward and make the best of every day and be thankful of what you've got and be thankful to be there. And let's hope it's going to be a better world and we won't be struck with any more dreadful things. It's a very different world we live in now. Very interesting to live for as long as you can to see what will happen. The message I can think of is um, the whole reason why we have this interview is to let future generations know what kind of life we had so that they should have a better life and should not have to suffer for all the traumas we had to suffer. People have got to know what it was all about. Because once it's swept under the carpet, it will be forgotten. Yes. It's, it's hard to go back. To speak about difficult things is the only way to, to get through. And to open up these things is the only way, really, to save generation after generation. If one so tries to be rational, Uh, I was burgled from an early age, if you like. First, they stole my childhood. Then they stole my possessions. Then they murdered my parents. I mean, this must affect your whole, your whole being, your whole attitude, your whole everything. My life, I found that there's been a lot of difficulty and hardship in my life and hard work and everything else, but. I have learned from everything. And I think in the long run, it stood me in good stead. I really don't regret any periods of my life or feel hard done by or whatever. And that is the honest truth. put these stones down for my grandfather and my mother, Elsa and Leopold. And uh, I thought I could move on, but time has shown me that I still have that uh, stone in my shoe. Some unpleasant things can happen to you but how you deal with them is in your hands. How you deal with the, what is given to you, which may be beyond your control, how you deal with it is entirely up to you. And it's your life, it's your responsibility. That's what I would tell my kids. That's what I would tell my grandchildren. You can't have everything you want. Doesn't mean to say you can't dream. But accept reality courageously. Don't recoil. Don't step back. Say yes to life.
to learn to accept people as they are and respect the individual, not try to change them or treat them in a particular way because that's their station in life. It doesn't work like that. Everybody's an individual. And it doesn't matter whether they actually agree with you on something or, or not. You have to interact and treat them as human beings. I, th I think that's the basic building block of society. If you don't do that, then eventually you run, you run into the sort of trouble that we did. Only to try to think of other people as individuals and not to think of people en masse, not to stereotype. Uh, because there is such a thing as mob mentality. And, and it can lead to dreadful things. And I wish anti-Semitism was over and people learned from what has happened in the Holocaust, etc. I hope it never reoccurs. I would say be very careful of any prejudice always treat everybody of whatever their color, their culture, their faith, whatever, however different of the, somebody else is, if they're different from you, they are still a human being. You have just learn what happened in Hitler's Germany. Please, please, learn from that just don't even begin to think of anybody else as the other i hope that people learn to live with each other I'll, if i look down from somewhere and see what's going on after my time has come, uh, then I'll watch out and see how much of that has improved. But it'll take generations. It will take generations. I have no illusions about that. For the future, listen to what the likes of us have had to say. Draw your own conclusions. But remember that this is not just a project about uh, about telling the stories of unhappiness and loss, but it, they should also be stories about gains and about the lessons that have been learned that can be applied for a future which will create more stable, better lives and bring people together rather than separate them. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, we are, as I said before, we are very privileged to have four interviewees with us today who appear in the film. Um, but I just wanted to share before we, I'm going to ask some question. Um, I said that we also collect photographs and documents and I just wanted to share uh, some of these photographs and documents. Uh, and I'll just uh, use those photographs to introduce uh, the four four panelists. So let's start with Kurt um, Kurt Marx. You can see him here on the left. He was born in in Cologne in 1925, and he arrived in England uh, on the 18th of January 1939 with fellow pupils from the Yavne School, 
and they were housed in a hostel um, sponsored by Walnine Synagogue. And at the bottom, you can see um, Kurt with his fellow pupils and teachers in Walnine hostels. Uh, and then the other picture, you can see him in, in front um, of his house in Cologne. Um, on the right, we have uh, pictures of uh, photographs of Eva Clark, uh, who was born Eva Nathan and uh, born in April 45 in Mauthausen concentration camp, five days before the liberation of the camps by the American army. And uh, at the bottom here, you have a photo of Eva and her mother uh, a few weeks after liberation. And maybe Eva can tell us a little bit more about um, the photographs. Um, she came uh, with her mother and her stepfather to uh, to England, to United Kingdom, and settled in in Wales. Um, and let me just continue. Um, yes, and here we we have some photographs of Anne and Bob Kirk. Um, on let me start with Anne. Anne was born Hannah Kuhn in 1928 in Berlin. She was raised in Cologne, Cottbus, and Berlin. And here you can see on the left at the bottom, you can see a photo of her mother and herself of, on the balcony of the flat in Berlin. She came on the 21st of April, 1939 on the kinder transport, an American ship called the Manhattan, which sailed from Hamburg to Southampton. And she was taken in by two Jewish sisters who were very active in the liberal um, There, you've frozen for a minute. Uh, featured on the photograph, oh. on, the, on the top left, wedding photographs. Yeah, and that means you've been married for almost 71 years, so that's that's a, quite an achievement. Um, Bob, Bob Kirk was born, can you hear me? Um, was born 1925 in Hanover and came to the UK also on a kinder transport in May 1939. Um, after staying with the family for a short time, he was evacuated. Um, to Whipsnade, and here you can see him on a bicycle. Um, he was billeted at, onto a farm, Dell Farm, uh, and you can see that picture on the middle here. And on the top, he's with his uh, with his brother um, and uncles in Hanover. And we can see at the bottom here uh, the the Kinder Transport visa, which was given given to Bob. He joined the Royal Artillery. Um, and in the photo here is from April 1945, where Bob was in, in the basic training. So just to share some photos with you. Um, so Eva, Kurt, Anne and Bob, uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. We have some time to discuss a little bit of your war experience, but also to talk about your experience as Holocaust educators who've shared your personal stories with thousands of people over the years. So my first question to you is, staying with the theme of Holocaust Memorial Day, I'd like to ask you, who were the people or organizations who were the light in the darkness in your own story of survival? Maybe should we start with Eva, please? Unmute yourself. Oh, you make me feel very emotional because the light in, the, in my darkness is my mother. And she always said that having me gave her the will to live after the war, after having lost nearly all of her family, my father, her parents, um, and lots of other members, the close family. And she said that when we came back to Prague uh, in May of 1945, um, she said a lot of survivors just were like, the word she used was flotsam. They came back to absolutely nobody and nothing. And a lot of people actually committed suicide. But she said, you know, I, d I gave her the will to live. So I, I can't go any further because just saying that makes me very emotional. And Eva, tell us a little bit about that photograph we showed oh. of you in your oh. mother's arms, which is just yeah. an extraordinary photograph. It is, uh, it's quite remarkable. It only came to my attention a few years ago. Uh, my mother said that after liberation by the Americans, hundreds of photographs had been taken of us by the GIs, but I had never managed to find a single one. Anyway, um, 
the, a, a film was found, a, a cine film taken by an American GI of his whole sort of campaign trail. And the very last image in that is that photograph you saw. And when uh, Wendy Holden, the biographer of Born Survivors, which tells the story of my mother and two other mothers, when she found it on the American Veterans Army website, I think, and she said, she took a photograph of it and she sent it to me and she said, is this your mother? And I just couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. And uh, uh, yes, it is. I sent it to two cousins of mine who are much older than I am. And they said, uh, I said, is this my mother? And my one cousin, Ivan in Prague said, well, I'm 95% sure it is. Um, and so did the other one, in fact. So it's, it, and my mother never saw this. She never knew that it existed. Um, so it is really quite a remarkable photograph to have. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, Kurt, maybe the same question to you in your story, who was who was the light in, in, in the darkness? Well, I think two people. No, it's Kurt. Oh, sorry. I thought you said Anne. Sorry. I'll come to you, Bob and Anne, in one second. Stay with us. Uh, that's it. No, no, I think you can hear me. Yes? Yes, yes we yes. can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> what, do you want to want me to, what do you want me to tell you? I, as you've seen, I, I was born in, I came from Cologne. And I went, I was very fortunate. I went to the, in my last two or three years, I went to the Yavne school in Cologne and our headmaster, the director of our school was Dr. Eric Klebanski. And I can thank him for my being here because after Kristallnacht, he became quite desperate and he said, I must bring my children, my pupils to England if that is possible. And he, from starting in November 1939, he actually succeeded in bringing us, the first group, to London in the beginning of 1939, in January 39. Not only had he organized it, he had to persuade the parents to allow us to go because most parents were not willing to let their children go. No, the children stay with us. We're going to, but they had plans and aspirations to go to the United States because war overtook everything and they never made it. And then they were deported from Cologne to Mali Trostanets in White Russia, which nobody had ever heard of. Very few people have heard of it today. Mali Trostanets near Minsk, which was an extermination camp. And people were taken there and murdered on arrival, they didn't even work there. They were promised that they would work in the East, but in fact, they were taken there to be exterminated by the Germans. And only in recent years, the last couple of years, have we seen a memorial put up over there. There is a rem remembrance park to remember that perhaps a quarter of a million people were murdered there which nobody knew anything about. And in 1917, two years ago, uh, they, in fact, the first inauguration took place and the German president and the Austrian president and the Russian mm -hmm. Belarus president were there, which was something extraordinary, which had never happened before. So, but it was all due to Klebanski and he couldn't save himself. He finished in Mali Trostanets in Russia with his family, although he managed to save 130 of his pupils. In fact, he couldn't uh, save himself. He lost his life over there. It's a very sad story that although he did all this work for everybody else, he couldn't save his own children. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Um, maybe just to add that uh, having grown up in Cologne myself, the, the, there were efforts to remember Erich Klebanski uh, starting, I think, in the early 80s, um, you know, with a, with a group 
trying to collect testimonies and create exhibitions. So, you know, I think it's it's definitely today much more known uh, the story of Klebanski than than it was. And I, when I did your interview, I thought it was very moving. Uh, one of the documents was the letter Erich Klebanski sent to the parents to give consent so that people could come on the kinder transport. And I'd never seen anything like it. And it's it's almost like a document, you know, you're allowed. That's right. Yes, he was a wonderful man. Okay, thank you, Kurt. So now to Bob and Anne, please, the same question. Who were the lights for you in the darkness? Well, I would have to nominate three people. My sponsor, all I ever knew about him was that his name was Smith and he was a South African. He sponsored six of us and each stayed for him but with him just for a week. He didn't take much notice of us, but uh, he, we were there. And he was the one who made my escape possible. So a light in the darkness. From there, I was sent to a young couple with two children. They made me so welcome. I became a member of the family, sent me to school, and I started to learn English, which was a revel revelation in itself. I was only with them for eight weeks, but we always kept in touch, I often visited. And even after they emigrated to Canada, we still kept up the connection. And when Anne and I met, she had to be presented and vetted. <laughs> the nearest thing to a family that I acquired after coming here. So a light in the darkness. But there's one more, much more surprising. I went to school on the morning of the 10th of November, 1938, blissfully <clears throat> unaware of what had happened during the night. Our biology teacher, who had no reason to be concerned about me, I was very bad at bi biology, met me at the door. Having asked what I was doing there, he proceeded to enlighten me, told me to go home and not to think of coming back to that school. Was he waiting for me? He certainly saved me from being beaten up by my classmates, an improbable light in the darkness. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And to you. Well, I named three people. My mother's best friend, who had already emigrated to London, met two ladies who were social workers in the East End of London, two unmarried sisters. And she said to them, my best friend Merlis in Berlin is desperately trying to get her little girl out of Berlin. Could you consider helping? Now, the rabbi at the ladies' synagogue, the liberal Jewish synagogue, had just preached a sermon to say the congregation really should think seriously about taking in a child from the kinder transport. So these two unmarried sisters, Millie and Sophie Levy, agreed. So there were lots of phone calls because my mother spoke very good English letters, photographs, and I arrived on the 21st of April, 39. And they sent me to schools. They looked after me. When Bob arrived, he became one of the family. And these two ladies were just, just wonderful. What a light. <sighs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Actually, I have a message that, yeah, okay, sorry, my internet connection is a bit unstable. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. And obviously, if people, if you want to find out more about everyone, please go to our website. All the photographs are there um, and your story is there. Um, now, I wanted to ask you something about the importance of testimony. What experiences did you have yourself going to school, children? What was maybe the most unexpected response you ever received? 
and you know how would you like to see these testimonies used in the future eva right um well like several um survivors i have been going to schools for many years and of course i my well everybody's story is unique i appreciate that um, I have to share with you, my mother used to say, yes, but ours is a little bit more unique. Um, I obviously don't have any memories because I was only, you know, a week old when the Americans arrived. Uh, so if you, again, if you'll forgive the, the pun, but I sort of straddle two camps. I am a survivor by an accident of birth, but I'm really more of a second generation because I don't have any memories. Uh, my mother used to speak quite a lot um, locally in Cardiff and, uh, and then when I started to do the talk she was very pleased that I did. She said, oh it's, it's a relief, I won't have to do it so often now. Um, and I must say I've always had a, well I think like all survivors, I've always had a, an amazing response from students. Um, they've always been very interested and also I feel that um, survivor testimony is is so important for one reason uh, for one of the reasons being that I think everybody can identify with one family nobody can identify with six million and to tell a family story all students all children they want to hear what happens next and you know we know the power of uh, telling stories and especially if they're true um, Bea, I've forgotten what else you asked me. No, about the future of testimony. The future. Well, I, it, that is obviously a very difficult one. I think it is very encouraging that there are a lot of second or even third generation um, people who now are interested in doing this, telling the story of their families. I have two sons. I have absolutely no idea at all if they will ever do anything like this. They both have young families and they are they're very interested and they you know they they well appreciated my mother but i think it's very good that there are members of second and third generations who want to do this i also think it's very good that survivor stories have been filmed um, by you and by others i think that is also a very valid way of telling these stories um mind you i also have to say and and i have to thank ajr for that a lot um, I think that, you know, since last March, we've all been on an amazing learning curve, giving our testimonies on Zoom or similar platforms. And that has enabled us, I think, to speak to much larger audiences. And, and although I think we all miss actually traveling to schools and meeting the students personally, but that is a very big advantage of such platforms. Mm. Okay. And something which would, might stay on in the future. Yes, yes, exactly. One hopes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Eva. Kurt, what about you? We can't hear you. Unmute, yeah. Uh, I've spoken, not all that often, to various schools, but I've spoken to children, strangely enough, in Russia via an interpreter, I've spoken to children in Germany, I've spoken to children here, and I always wondered, does it affect them? Do they remember what you tell them? Uh, when you, the children were sort of the age I was when I left and told them what had happened to me. And one story was related to me. I had told this class of children, they were 13 or 12 or 13 years old, of what happened to me. I'd, well, this was in Cologne, strangely enough. And um, I was told by somebody who was attending that class that two years later, this naughty little boy who was being asked by the teacher, have you ever met a refugee? And they were thinking of the Syrian and Turkish refugees that were in Germany at that time. And he put up his hand and he says, yes, I know a refugee. And says, well, tell us all about it. And he was talking about me. He was telling the other children what I had told him two years earlier. So I felt at least he had remembered what I had told them. 
And this was very important to me because when you are with the children, you don't really know are they listening or usually one can tell apparently because they are attentive. They don't wriggle about, they don't fidget. And if they are listening, then class is quiet. So I'm not an experienced teacher. I have, I have never realized this. And I have found that when I have spoken to them, they tend to be very, very quiet, which is a sign that they are actually listening. So this I found gratifying that at least you don't talk to children or who then forget at the moment you have told them. And I hope that they will repeat the story and tell, perhaps take it home and tell their parents what they have heard and what they have experienced. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt, very much. And Bob and Anne, I mean, you may be, um, you are special because you do presentations together. So that's a very unique situation. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. Well, obviously, we both have totally different experiences. So Bob starts the talk, his experiences, up to Chris Dunlop, and I come in, and we also do a presentation at the same time, which obviously brings it home to the children and to grown-ups, and we do it to all ages. We've just actually last, or well, early this week, uh, talked to a scout crew. Um, and so we basically do, do a lock until the end, and then the questions come to either of us. And it seems to work quite well. Well, it was accidental. Anne was giving a talk at a school in Hartford. And during question time, one particular question came up. And she looked at, well, I was in the body of the horn. She looked across and I think Bob can do better at answering that one. <laughs> so she, I went up on, the, hold on, him up on the stage. And I answered the question. I stayed up there. And then a few more questions came up, which we did between us. When we got home, I thought, this worked quite well. <laughs> so from there on, we developed this double act. And I always tell people they get two for the price of one. It, <laughs> it works pretty well. The only problem, of course, is that we take longer. So when uh, you get situations like we had earlier this week when we were speaking in the framework of a council memorial event, we were squeezed for time. And I had to sort of adapt as we went along. Which is not easy <laughs> to do as you're going along. And it gets some surprising uh, events. I mean, I think the two that I, I remember best is a visit to a Muslim girls' school. We went with some trepidation, but they were amazing. There were probably about 300 girls in the hall. They were so well prepared. They listened, as Court says, in absolute silence. And I think, and this is three years ago, or thereabouts, I think we could still be there answering questions if it, if it hadn't been called to a horde. The other one, I was asked to speak some years ago now at the Jewish Museum to a visiting German school. Now, this was a problem. My German has got a bit rusty. So I wrote a speech and sent it to my niece in Brazil for her to edit. <laughs> it was all right. Again, the questions showed that they knew a little, but not really very much. So the questions did go on and on. And I hope they took something home with them. I mean, part of your question was, what do we think about the importance of testimony? Well, to quote Spinoza, if you want the present to be different from the past, study the past. And the variations on it, particularly Edmund Burke, 100 years later, there's a progression, ignorance, 
fear of the other, discrimination, victimization, murder. What's the antidote? Education. And ignorance and intolerance and victimization aren't going away anytime soon. And we who survived the Shoah, what, by whatever means, escape, um, survivors of a camp, kinder transport, whatever it is, we have an obligation to tell the story, to demonstrate what happens when misinformation is used to isolate and demonize individuals or minorities. And I think somebody's already said it. Our testimony, our testimony is lived experience, not textbook. And that must go on to the next generations so that the truth is preserved. Standing aside and being keeping quiet is not an option. Thank you very, very much for your very profound words. I think we can take all inspiration uh, from you going and talking to school classes. And I think, you know, some of us have taken on the baton and certainly refugee uh, voices is committing, uh, is committed to taking the baton and um, creating more educational resources with the testimonies we've collected. Actually, and I have a question on that, if I may. Sure. Uh, we're creating a lot of resources, but technology devel develops and changes. Are we sure that in years to come, there'll be the technology to use that format? I mean, we, we progressed from real to real films to cassettes and so on, and the one couldn't transfer to the other. You're right. Absolutely. It is a very, very good question. Um, but we have to assume that we, you know, the data, the material needs to migrate with the latest technology. So, you know, when we have a cassette, we could transfer the cassette to something else. We could transfer the CD. So hopefully whatever format there will be, uh, will be, you know, will be able to be translated to the new, new format. And who knows, maybe in, in the future, there'll be things we can't even think about. Um, you know, for example, now uh, some testimonies are collected through uh, through mobile phones, uh, through apps which uh, you know help people to interview themselves or to interview each other. Um, so that's something nobody could think about, you know, some twenty years ago. So there's some interesting developments, and I think Michaela mentioned that as well in the digital realm. Anyway, um, thank you and. Uh, Sorry for the short time, we don't have more time to discuss, but um, hopefully in the future we will. And now to um, pass on please to Susie Kaufman, who has some closing remarks for us. Good afternoon, everybody. Bea asked me to give a few closing remarks, possibly because I wear various hats here today. First and foremost, I'm the daughter of refugees from Bamberg in Bavaria and Vienna. You briefly saw my mother in the film talking about anti-Semitism. As second generation, without any British blood in my body, I feel very continental. It must come from the rye bread I had with my picnic lunches at school um, when the other girls were eating white sliced bread. I certainly felt different growing up from my peers. Secondly, I worked for the AJR in charge of the kitchen at their day centre for over 25 years, eventually running the centre. It was an immense privilege. I miss those days so much. I saw my Omas in all the ladies. Of course, in the dining room, we had to have separate tables for the Berliners and Viennese as they sat to enjoy the kosher continental food our amazing team lovingly prepared. Finally, as a proud member of South Hampstead Synagogue, which was founded in the 1960s by refugees from the continent. So as the refugees themselves asked, what conclusion do we draw? Our refugee heritage must never be forgotten. 
They have contributed so much to British society. Their voices and those of the camp survivors continue to be heard through AJR's Refugee Voices project. This project continues. And if you or anyone you know wishes to give their testimony, do contact Dr. Bea Lefkovich at the AJR. It is vital that the younger generation hear these voices and the AJR is determined to get refugee voices into schools in as many ways as possible. Only through education can we hope to rid the world of anti-Semitism. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Susie, for, for your words. And I think really the, the, the thing we can take home from here is there are two, two key words, which I think is one is education and one is the truth. And of course they're related. Um, and I think it's, that's comes as a, as a mission for AGR Refugee Voices and for the AGR support for, for Holocaust education. So just uh, for me to say thank you very much for everyone and I'll pass on now to, to Michael for the last words. Thank you, Bea, uh, and thank you everybody for participating. And just to come back on something Bob mentioned when he was talking a little earlier, in case you haven't seen it in the chat uh, section, that that very message is reiterated by Michaela Kukula, who apologised she had to leave, and she says, uh, thank you for your testimonies. testimonies. It is very moving. I will take away never to see the other in the person next to me. I wish you a good continuation. All the best and stay safe. So you have it from the highest, uh, a high accolade uh, from Michaela there. And I think all that leads me to do is to thank uh, everybody for participating to Lord Pickles uh, and Michaela Kukla and to Susie. It's very hard to follow the chairman's wife. That's another hat she's wearing today. Uh, but thank you all. And especially to our four member participants, to uh, Eva, to Anne and Bob uh, and to Kurt, uh, and thank you to colleagues for organising and to your, you, Bear, and your, your team for putting this together. Uh, and as we always say at the end of these events, safe journeys home, and we look forward to seeing you all at our future events. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Do we have time for a few questions or, Susan? I had a lot of comments about how, how wonderful and, and how highly regarded the participants are. Um, the only thing I'd say is a lot of people would like to see the whole film rather than just a link. I know you've sent it out with Zoom, but we will make that available maybe via our newsletter again next week. Yeah, we can make it available. And if you go to the AJR Refugee Voices website, it's uh, you can find it there. It's on the We'll put it on the front page. Okay, I uh, think AJR... Uh, refuge, AJR Refugee Voices dot org dot UK. Okay, all right, and we'll um, we'll put a link on the newsletter that goes out next Monday um, for anyone who wants to see the whole film. Um, that sort of seems to to really be the the basis of the a lot of the questions. I think people are a little bit silenced by the content. To be honest, mm -hmm. quite remarkable. So, okay, okay. Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you again, everyone. Thank you. We thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bea. Thank everybody you. Everybody keep safe. Everybody keep safe. You Good keep night. safe, Kirk. Keep safe. We'll do our best, like little, <laughs> boy, like little boy scouts. <laughs>